Si eres. Hey, what's up, it's your man Kavon J, and I want to welcome you to another episode of 901 All Access, your backstage pass to the city. And today, we at Mahogany Memphis. So we're going to hang out, we're going to kick it, we're going to do what we do. And stopping by is producer extraordinaire, Carlos Six July Brody, will be in the building. So let's go ahead and get into the show. Let's get into the first video from a gentleman named Son of the Wave. And the name of the video, let it go. It's 901 All Access. Let's go. Kavon J901 All Access, and I have a special, special guest. My brother, Carlos Six July Brody, is in the building. Carlos, what's up, man? What's up, brother? Look, My I just, brother. I just, this right here. When I say, you hear people say it all the time about being family. This is truly family, right here. Ooh. I've actually known Carlos half of my life, so I just want to say, first of all, thank you for doing it, man. Appreciate it. And then, Thank you. Yeah, so I, I want to start. I want to actually just go ahead and jump right into it and start from the beginning. Okay. 
Where did you even, what even influenced you to get into to music first? Um, I always tell a story of me coming from a musical family. Right. Um, I had uncles that was in the business, singers, engineers, my three uncles. Um, one was in uh, the original Mad Lads. Uh, then I had uh, my uncle, uh, that was William. He actually became an engineer um, for Stax and for uh, Willie Mitchell later later on. Mm -hmm. um, the Barcades and that whole scene, you know. Um, my other uncle, Bertram, was in a group called the Newcomers first, and the Newcomers became quick. Um, wow. And right. uh, Newcomers, were on, they were on Stax. As well as my other uncle, Randy, he was Randy Brown, he was in the original Newcomers, him and Bertram, but Randy ended up being a solo artist, signed to uh, Casablanca Parachute Records, same okay. label as Donna Summers. Right, right. Uh, and he had, um, I want to say he had like three or four albums. So you've been around music your whole life, baby. Whole life. I, as long as I can remember, what, three years old? Okay. Me being in the studio with Rufus Thomas. So. Um, which was my godfather. <laughs> really? Yeah. See, now that's something I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know Rufus yeah. Summers was your Mr. godfather. Funky Chicken himself, he used to take me to the studio um, pretty much all the time. Um, he used to come get me and have me in the studio. I actually, um, I don't know if people are familiar with Larry Nix. Larry Nix was a mix engineer who became a mastering master. Right? Okay. Um, his setup was in Arden. And Larry mastered everybody's music from 3-6, wow. you know, Gotti on down. Um, and uh, Larry has pictures of me in the studio. Um, when, you was, a, when you were yeah, small? Yeah, yeah. And when I re, um, I started using him for mastering, he used to tell me these stories about how I used to always, you know, approach him in the studio and had questions. And <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, where did... Now, you've been around music your whole life, right. but what actually got you into beat making? Um, I think it was about the sixth grade. Another family member, uh, Doug Jones, was a DJ. That's my cousin. That's Fred Jones' brother. Okay. Doug used to DJ the parties at Havenview, and he had this elaborate setup with speakers as big as, you know, this doorway, mm -hmm. right? And um, just seeing him in the gym, with his whole setup, it inspired me to DJ, right? I wanted to DJ from seeing him and from DJing, um, the inspiration to make beats actually came from that. But uh, I would say there's two records that I heard, Eric B is president, mm. right? Classic. Th that actually made me want to make beats because I heard that the, the beat on that record right. was just crazy to me. And I heard that we were probably in the seventh, eighth grade, we might have been, what, 80, 85, 86 when I heard that. Now, let me say this. Now, this is, Carlos <laughs> didn't know I was going to say this, but this brother was making beats back in the day when, when I first saw Carlos, you know, before everybody had the elaborate board and we had right. the, the drum machine. This man had a Casio keyboard <laughs> that, was, yep, that was missing keys. He would use that as a sampler. Yeah. And then he had a Technique 1200 turntable yeah. in a, a tape technique. deck. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was drive technique. Right. Mm -hmm. And had a double double cassette tape deck right. and was making killer beats. Making beats off of that. Killer that beats. That was my Uncle uh, Bertram's Casio. I appreciate that, Uncle B. <laughs> appreciate that, Uncle B. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. let me ask you this. Where did your... At that time, when you started making beats, mm -hmm. and you said Eric B's, uh, is president. E Eric B's president. Mm -hmm. Who was the producer that you looked up to? Like, okay. At, at that one. time, not knowing, uh, Marley was credited as the producer for that. So mm -hmm. Marley was kind of the spark, um, just by hearing the way he did his scratches, and um, like again, I heard that beat. Then I heard uh, make the music with your mouth beats. Oh. Right, another class, another Marley joint. You know what I mean? Right. So it was like, man, this dude Marley Marley's on fire. Right. You know, he's crazy. His his style of production is different. Marley was the first cat to, um, you know, most cats would use the the, the break beats. Right. right. Use the right. entire break beat. Right. Marley would. He was the first cat that sampled the the drum sounds of the break beat mm. and made his own beat. So like the like uh, uh, um, MC Shan, um, the bridge, right? Yes. That's uh, impeach the president. 
And the way he tells the story is that he made a mistake and sampled the kick and the snare. And when he hit the buttons on the drum machine, he was like, oh man, do you know what's about to happen? Y'all getting like, a lesson you know I mean? right now, y'all getting oh, a yeah. lesson right now. So he was, he was able to recreate the beat the way he wanted to with the sounds, the, the actual drum sounds, the kick, snare, and the hi-hat. And um, just hearing those records and the way he put them together, and could nobody figure out why his record sounded like that because of what he was doing. It's like, man, we know he's using these records, these break beats, but it, it just the, the drums don't sound like it because everybody's using either the, you know the Casio or the um, the 808, the Roland 808, or different DMX drum machines. Right, you know, right. Like, like you know, I think um, um, Sucker MCs is a DMX, you know, and that's how most of the hip hop records are sounding in. But Marley's records is coming out sounding way different. The drums are way different, you know. So let's move up some because okay. back in the day. We were the ones that, like, we had a little crew back in the <laughs> yeah, day. Yeah. And what we used to do, we used to try to meet all the artists yeah. and give them demo tapes. Yes. And Carlos <laughs> was so nonchalant. Like, Carlos, man, we finna, we finna hook up with him today. All right, you know, y'all just let me know how that go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Carlos was so laid back, but you was actually in the lab creating yes. beats and making moves. Right. Who was the first? artists that say okay let me use you for something uh actually when when me and um as far as major artists are just period yeah, ma major artists. major artists um excuse me it could could be considered uh al capone because al capone was signed to um was it sick with it nah al was signed to um emi back in the day that's right. Eli had a, a, a production deal, a label deal with EMI, and he had uh, Al Capone and SMK. So, um, me, Al Capone, uh, Lil Pat, Gangsta Pat, um, we used to all, SMK, we used to all work on Al's records at the warehouse studio down on, you know, on Tennessee Street. Mm. That's where the warehouse was, where the houses are now, but it was a big warehouse. Okay. He took the warehouse, left the open part but it had two rooms that he made into a studio a and studio b and that was warehouse um warehouse studio warehouse music man i forgot and that's about what that. i was signed to this was like what 92 91 92 and uh that's we, we used to hang out there every day so that was pretty much my kickstart um in the business i consider him a major artist because he had a major deal that's right right al, um, did, al did have a major deal after al you know um it would have to be um, Biggie, right? My first oh. check came from Biggie. Oh, hold up, hold up. <laughs> All right, look, we finna, we, finna get in, we finna get into another video, and then we gonna get into the Biggie, because Biggie needs his own talking points when we talk about Biggie. Right. So, um, I get the signal back there, we can order some food. That's what we gonna do, we gonna order some food, and then we gonna come back, but let's get into this video while we order this food. You know what you gonna eat? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, I always know I'm eating. You 
right, y'all. It's your man, Kavanje901 All Access. I got my guy in the building, Carlos Brody. That was Jordan occasionally, and she calls that one Hate to Admit It. And so now we're going to talk about how the whole thing got started with Biggie. You know, how did that whole situation start? Um, with Big, my wife, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time, um, knew what I um, was trying to accomplish. So she gave me the idea of sending um, B tapes. Shout out to Angela. What's up, Angela? Hey, Queen B. <laughs> um, where's my heart? She gave me the idea of sending um, B tapes. Like, why don't you send like five or six B tapes to different record companies mm -hmm. to see what, what happens? Needless to say, I got rejected by all five of them except for one. And it was uh, the bad boy uh, representative, Hard Pierre. And he actually, excuse me, he actually called me. I had my number on all the beat tapes. I think I put like maybe 10 beats on each tape. Mm -hmm. He called me back. It's like, let me speak to this 6th July guy. Who is it, right? I'm like, this is, this is he. He was like, man, listen, you got some joints on here. He's like, I'm gonna have my guy to call you back. His name is Machine. He's gonna be giving you a call to um, talk to you about your music. Mm -hmm. So probably the same day, I wanna say the same day or the next day, Machine called me. He was like, man, it's like, yo, you got some joints on here. He was like, but um, it's like, I like a lot of them joints. He was like, but I wanna see what else you could do. So mm -hmm. send me another tape. And um, I said, okay, bet. At the time, I was working at FedEx, so I could overnight joints, you know what right, I mean? So right. Shout out to FedEx. Uh, <laughs> get that discount, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So I, I overnight, I said, you have it tomorrow. He's like, well, yeah, I got you. So I sent, I sent the tape, another tape. He called me back the next day. Actually, when he got it, he called me. He wasn't even finished listening. He was like, um, I got an idea. I'm gonna let a couple of people hear it. You know, I just wanna make sure you was good with that. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. So he called me the next day. He's like, yo, you gotta come to New York. I'm like, for what? He's like, big one, one of your joints. One, two of your joints. And I'm like, for real? He was like, yeah, so I hooked the tickets up. So he hooked up the tickets. Week later, I'm on the plane in New York. For, for the people who may not know, tell them some of the guys that you, like, some of the people that you've produced, that you've worked with. Um, of course, uh, Notorious, B.I.G., um, Lil' Kim, Puff Daddy, um, Nas, Raekwon, uh, Ghostface, um, uh, N.D.I. Lil' Kim, N.D.I., I'm trying to go in order. Oh, my fault. Uh, 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 um, um, 112, N.D.I., 112, let's see, uh, Sophia on the West Coast, um, Two Chains, Yo Gotti, Three Six Mafia, Nappy Roots, Nappy Roots. Um, we got uh, a lot of Dark Man, which was my artist at the time. We he, he, we had a, a certain situation. Right. Um, God, I know I'm leaving. Mary J. Uh, Mary, no. yeah. Mary was a uh, I Can Love You um, was sa a sample queen dude. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, that's right. you know, um, man, I, I know I'm leaving out a lot you, of people. Uh, Black Rob. See, and, that, and that's a perfect segue. Yeah. Um, before, before Mace. We, oh, my gosh, <laughs> Mace. Before we get into this, um, your thoughts on Black Rob? Black Rob, man. Black Rob was an incredible talent. You know, it's a great loss. A great, you know, we, we lost a great one. Right. Very humble guy. Right. Um, I did uh, Jasmine on his Life Story album. If you have not heard Jasmine, <laughs> you oh my, you got to hear Jasmine. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what do you feel about DMX? Black Rob, it's crazy because uh, Black Rob and DMX are on Mace's album. DMX is on two, two, two of my records from Mace's album, Take What's Yours and 24 Hours to Live. So 24 Hours to Live has Black Rob and Mace on it. What's crazy about 24 Hours to Live, we did that at the House of Blues. The, the production was done at the House of Blues. Right. Um, that's why I made the beat it. Um, 
it's just an incredible loss uh, to the, the hit. We, we lost two great ones. I mean, X is, you, you just, words can't explain X right. and how dynamic of a person he was. Not, e not even his music. His music is a whole nother level. Right. But um, as a person, you know, the right. things that he was battling and able to come out of that and make the music that he was making, right. you know. Um, musically, X was doing double platinum, going double platinum in like a week. You know what I mean? He did that like three, four times. Every time he released a joint, it was like double platinum in like a week or two. Wow. You know what I mean? That was unheard of. He was the first one doing something like that. Back then, we talking right. like, you know, what, 97, you know, 97, 98 in, in, in that time? Well, nobody doing that going platinum in a week. That's crazy. So this is what we're going to do. This is Unorthodox. We are in Mahogany, Memphis. <laughs> Shout out to Scott. Come here, Scott. Mahogany. We, we, finna, we, finna, we in Mahogany right now. And Scott is the man that laid this out for us. I know this this all this <laughs> kills production <laughs> etiquette and all of that. But uh, this is Scott Crawford, the man who made all of this possible. And we finna get ready to get out of here. I want to thank my brother Carlos for stopping by. Yes, sir. And um, we gonna get into a Memphis classic, actually produced by Carlos. Carlos, I'm gonna let you introduce it. Cause man, I'm this is one of my favorite records by one of my favorite guys. This is Yo Gotti's Gangsta Party. Um, shout out to Yo Gotti, he's doing big things. You know, taking over the industry in the world with the CMG label. Right. Um, but uh, again, this is Yo Gotti's Gangsta Bar Party, produced by none other than myself. <laughs> Hello, 6 July Brody, y'all. Thank y'all, man, for tuning in once again. Shout out to everybody. Shout out, shout out to Mahogany. <laughs> shout out to Scott, everybody, that's, that's man. That's that hunger. You trying to hurry up and get to, get to your phone. Uh, 901 All Access. Aisha, thank you, babe. All right, y'all, we out of here. 901 All Access. All right, we out. <laughs>